On this episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, New York City's very own Ripper case. You know, if if he the killer had just killed her, had just strangled her, and left and not ripped her open and not eviscerated her, it would have gone down as an unsolved murder and nobody would have paid much attention to it. There had been a murder in that very room a little bit earlier that went unsolved, but it was just a run-of-the-mill murder. This case, though, anybody who looked into the room, the first thought in their mind was Jack the Ripper. Welcome to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Thank you so very much for listening. I am very happy to have as my guest today, once again, George R. Deagle Sr. He is a former legal skills professor at the Levin College of Law and assistant state attorney for the Third Judicial Circuit of Florida. He prosecuted many, many criminal cases during his time in that position from 1975 to 2005. We talked a couple of years ago about his book, Six Capsules, The Gilded Age Murder of Helen Potts. He's got a brand new book out now entitled The East River Ripper, The Mysterious 1891 Murder of Old Shakespeare. Thank you so much for returning to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yes. So what was it about this crime that interested you enough to want to write a book about it? Well, uh, when I was uh, researching the Six Capsules case, I read the memoirs of uh, the prosecutor, Francis Wellman, and he talked about a number of cases that he'd handled. And one of those cases was... uh, a uh, case he called the American Jack the Ripper. And uh, he said some interesting things about the case. And I decided, I, you know, I'd look into it a little bit more and uh, see what it was all about. And I looked into it, and what he was saying about the case in his memoirs wasn't squaring with, uh, with what I was reading in other, in, in other sources. I had determined after writing six capsules, and I was going to do a professional biography of Wellman and go through and write as much as I could about each of the murder cases that he had tried. And so in that process, this case stood out as being different from what he said to what other people were saying about the case, were writing about the case. And, uh, According to the uh, to the other sources I was looking at, uh, the the man had been pardoned because he was innocent, uh, and he had been uh, framed by the New York City Police Department, and that did not uh, sound like the Francis Wellman that uh, that I had uh, come to know from reading other cases and reading about him and other and other sources. So I went back and read his uh, story of the the case again, and some of the things he said in in his story just didn't add up. Uh, They were uh, inconsistent. And I said, well, I'll get to the bottom of it. So I got to the bottom of it. So your book is set in such an interesting time. The Whitechapel murders in London were still looming large in the minds of people, not only in England, but America as well. Right. The chief of detectives in New York City had a worldwide reputation as being the greatest thinking detective of the age. And according to the traditional story about the case, people had asked him what he would do while the the 
Ripper murders were going on in Whitechapel, what he would do, how he'd handle the case different. And he had bragged and said he'd have the Ripper in uh, jail in 48 hours if Ripper came to Lakes, came to uh, New York City. And uh, then just a short while later, he got a letter from Jack the Ripper saying, batten down the hatches, here I come, see if you can catch me, or words to that effect. And then not long after that, he had his own Ripper-style murder to, to, to try to solve. Now, I searched and searched trying to find where he had ever made any such statement to any newspaper, and I never could find it. Uh, now, I, I did find some uh, some quotes that he said that uh, weren't exactly laudatory of the London police, but nothing as uh, braggadocious as uh, saying that he'd have Ripper in, in jail in 48 hours. What had Burns done uh, professionally? to give him this stellar reputation? Well, Burns completely modernized the the New York City Police Department investigative uh, wing. When he took over the the criminal investigative department, it was loaded down with people who were political appointees and who were not very... They were not very industrious, and they weren't very capable of solving anything. If somebody came in with his hands up, they might be able to solve that. But uh, they didn't do a very good job. And Burns took all but just one or two of the men in the uh, uh, criminal investigative department and put them back in uniform. And he started recruiting men into the department who were uh, competent, uh, who were motivated, who were professional, and he started instituting as many different avant-garde scientific methods of crime detection as possible. You know, things like uh, contact cards. You stop somebody on the street, an officer stops somebody on the street, and he makes a little contact card about what uh, about about his uh, contact with the with the suspect, and that goes into a file, and then you've got a a kind of a uh, a record of what's going on on the street, who's out after after hours and whatnot, and it gives you great intelligence information about what's going on in the underworld. Uh, he drew a line across New York City that he called a deadline, and he said that no criminal would come south of the deadline, no known criminal would come south of the deadline on pains of being arrested. And anybody who was known to, uh, to have a criminal background who came south of the, quote, deadline, close quote, that was enough to get himself put in jail. Now, of course, that wouldn't fly in today's era, but uh, back in those days, he could get away with that. Uh, he started the, the first mugshot file in the, uh, in the history of uh, law enforcement in the United States. And uh, it was had hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, of mugshots of various uh, various. Uh, men who uh, had been arrested, and uh, I had a picture of the uh, of his mugshot file. It covered a complete wall, looked like, in the police department. Uh, but uh, uh, due to space limitations, wasn't able to get it into the book. Uh, he relied as heavily as he possibly could on scientific evidence, uh, taking cases to uh, taking uh, you know evidence to uh, medical men. Uh, chemists and whatnot, uh, he was just way ahead of his time. And uh, he would apply a little good feeling, I guess you'd call it, to uh, uncooperative suspects. He was the inventor of uh, the third degree interrogation technique, which, uh, you know, anybody who's seen a, a, a noir movie from the 30s or 40s knows what the third degree interrogation technique uh, consisted of. Uh, and he solved cases. I mean, he solved them right and left and solved some real, real difficult cases and got a nationwide, not nationwide, worldwide reputation. I think you write that that deadline he imposed was to protect Wall Street, right? That's correct. And the Wall Street people were very, very grateful to him. And uh, uh, they uh, allowed him to do a little bit of insider trading 
and I don't think I don't I don't remember if I put that in the book or not, but uh, uh, he got uh, got rich doing insider trading. Of course, it wasn't against the law at that time, but uh, it still wasn't a very savory thing to be doing. No, not at all. So much of the focus of your book centers around this notorious place called the East River Hotel. Yes. In New York City's Fourth Ward. Could you explain to my listeners what this place was like in 1891? Okay. Wellman called it a uh, Rains Law Hotel. Under the Rains Law, uh, you couldn't serve liquor on weekends in a bar, but you could in a hotel. So they set up hotels all over the, all over New York City that the first floor was a bar and then the floors above were hotels. And that way you could serve liquor seven days a week. And a lot of Rains Law hotels were uh, very shady places. And the East River Hotel was about the shadiest of the lot. You could uh, buy liquor on the first floor and buy women's bodies on the floors above. And a lot of these women would congregate in something referred to as the box, right? Yes, they had a special area for the prostitutes to come into and sit that was kind of uh, off from the, the, the men, and men would come in and sit down, talk with them, buy, buy them drinks, and negotiate for uh, services upstairs in the, uh, in the hotel rooms. So on April 24th, 1891, Edward Fitzgerald, the janitor of the East River Hotel, made a gruesome discovery. Can you share with us uh, what he found? Uh, Fitzgerald was a, he was kind of a night man and he was kind of a, uh, uh, a janitor and jack of all trades sort sort of a guy. And his job in the morning was to go around to the rooms and wake the people up who were still in bed, rouse them out, get them gone, and pick up the keys for the rooms. Uh, whenever you went upstairs, uh, you'd uh, go up, there's one flight of stairs going up, and you'd get your room key, you'd get a candle, you'd get a bucket of beer or ale or some other uh, liquid refreshment, and you'd go upstairs with your uh, with a woman that you had uh, had negotiated with, and then uh, transact your business. And the men would leave after the business was transacted, and they'd leave the key keys in the uh, hotel rooms. So Fitzgerald, his job was to go upstairs, go around, collect the keys, uh, make sure everybody was gone, and uh, then the housekeeper would come in and. Uh, you know, rearrange the mess. Uh, it looked to me like there was a whole lot of housekeeping going on. But on this particular particular day, he was uh, went to room 31, I believe it was. Uh, it was on the top floor. They call it the fourth floor, but it's actually a, five, a five-story building. Uh, in those days, they started numbering ground floor, first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor there. What we would call the second floor was the, four, was the first floor. So he goes upstairs uh, to the fourth floor, goes to room 31, the door's locked, he unlocks the door, looks in, and he finds a, a charnel house. A uh, woman has been butchered on the bed. Uh, closes the door, goes back downstairs. Oh gosh, I can't remember the maid's name. Tells her what he saw. She goes upstairs, sees it. They go back downstairs. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, the bartender, Tommy Thompson, says, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have to, we're going to, have to fix up the gas register before we call the police to make it look legitimate. You know, they just make up names for people uh, to go into these rooms. So they wrote down that a, a man by the name of C. Nicklo, K-N-I-C-K-L-O, had rented that room, uh, just completely made up name. And they sent for the police. And the investigation began. So when police arrived, they knew that this was not a normal New York City murder. 
Many people believed that it could be a Jack the Ripper murder because of the severity of the... Uh, of the wounds, yes. Wounds, right, yeah. Uh, you know, if if he the killer had just killed her, had just strangled her, and left and not ripped her open and not eviscerated her, it would have gone down as an unsolved murder and nobody would have paid much attention to it. There had been a murder in that very room a little bit earlier that went unsolved. But it was just a run-of-the-mill murder. This case, though, anybody who looked into the room, first thought in their mind was Jack the Ripper. And then the next next question was, well, did Jack the Ripper make good on his boast? Has he come to come to New York City? Is this going to continue? Did this murder resemble the Whitechapel murders? It resembled the Whitechapel murders, but the detectives at Scotland Yard said they didn't think that Jack the Ripper had done it. The resemblance was in the mutilation. Uh, the, the woman's, uh, the victim's uh, stomach had been ripped open and her intestines had been taken out and placed between her legs. Or at least some of her intestines had been taken out and placed between her legs. And um, there had been a, a cross or an X carved on one of her buttocks but she had been strangled. And Jack the Ripper's preferred MO was to slash the victim's throat and uh, then do the mutilation. So this was out of character for what they thought was a, a typical Ripper style murder. They didn't think Jack the Ripper had done it. But of course, the newspapers embraced the brutality, and shouted to the heavens that this could very well be America's first Ripper case. And Thomas Burns is is put into a tough position, isn't he? Yeah. You know, Burns thought he had a good working relationship with the news media. But I don't know. The media can can turn on you in a heartbeat. And Burns was an inviting target because of his notoriety. You know, if you can take down the kingpin, that's put, put a feather in your cap. So they uh, began to criticize Burns about the way he was handling the case. You know, why hadn't he made good on his boast that he was going, that he put the Ripper in jail immediately, if not sooner. And uh, that was the, that was the theme uh, they even printed a cartoon. I think the cartoon uh, made it into the book of, of Burns sweating over trying to piece together the puzzle of the of the Ripper case and uh, the chief of police of uh, London standing in the background with a smile, a smirk on his face saying, yeah, yeah buddy, now you got your problem, don't you? <laughs> so where did they begin? W- what evidence was discovered at the scene of the crime what direction did police go after their initial examination of the crime scene? Well, the first thing that uh, the uh, precinct captain did, and he had just come from the uh, detective division, uh, hadn't been a precinct captain long, was to establish crime scene integrity by placing a, uh, a guard at the bottom of the stairs Nobody goes up, nobody comes down, nobody messes with the scene. And then they call the the, the coroner, who uh, was uh, the coroner in the Six Capsules case. And uh, if you remember the mess that the, the coroner made in that case, uh, he duplicated the mess in this case. He got to the scene, and he's a He's an elected public official. He has the authority. And he decides he's going to go upstairs and examine the crime scene and take about a half a dozen or more newspaper reporters with him. So he goes upstairs to examine the body, goes in, and uh, the reporters crowd into the room with him. You know, that is not the way to 
make sure that you've got a pristine crime scene for collecting evidence. And they hadn't started collecting evidence yet. Uh, and that, that did really cause a problem because it wasn't until that afternoon that they found a blood trail that led out of the uh, room 31 down the hall to room 33. And then the question is, well, nobody saw the blood trail that morning. Uh, here's a blood trail this afternoon. Who's to say it was left by some newspaper reporter stepping his foot into that huge puddle of blood on the floor in room 31 and tracking it down the hall to room 33. So that, uh, you know, that was a sort of Achilles heel to the uh, prosecution case all the way through. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a problem right up to the very end of the case. If the uh, coroner had been professional, left the newspaper reporters downstairs and then, then they discovered the uh, the blood blood spatters. Uh, there would have been a lot less commotion to be made about uh, uh, the about crime scene integrity than was made by the defense. So, identifying the victim was a priority for police, and also I- identifying the person who accompanied the victim to room thirty one that night. So, so how did they go about trying to determine? those identities. She is fairly well known in the fourth ward. They knew her as old Shakespeare because uh, she had a penchant for when she got drunk, she'd quote Shakespeare. There was some mix up though. There were two Shakespeare quoting prostitutes in the fourth ward at that time. And, it, and there was some confusion in the newspapers about which one of them was, it, it was that, that had, uh, had been killed. They were finally able to identify the, positively identify the victim several days later when her daughter came down from, uh, I believe it was Massachusetts, and viewed the body and claimed it. And it was a woman named Carrie Brown uh, who had been married to a sea captain and had uh, fallen into alcoholism and had gotten in, in such a bad state of alcoholism that her husband divorced her. And uh, from there, she came to New York and uh, worked for a while as an actress. And then uh, when the drink got too much for her, she made her living as a prostitute. And she was an older woman. Yeah, she was in her late 50s. Uh, It looked as old as possibly 60 was uh, what uh, people said she looked like. But she was a little bit younger than that. So once they had identified her body as that of Carrie Brown, police proceeded to question hotel staff as well as other prostitutes known to frequent the hotel. Yeah, well, uh, they had a unique method of, of questioning people. They arrested everybody, carried them to the house of detention for witnesses and interrogated them. And, uh, you know, they talked to... Uh, all the prostitutes who had been in Carrie Brown's company that night, uh, the denizens uh, of the uh, of the hotel, uh, they put a, put uh, Eddie Fitzgerald in jail, and uh, they all sat in jail. About uh, eight or ten of them, from the uh, the day of the murder until the trial was over. And while all this was going on one of the prostitutes pointed out a, a gentleman who was known in the, uh, in the area as Frenchy. Uh, he was an Algerian immigrant uh, who had been in New York City a year, maybe a year and a half. And she said, you need to look at that guy right there. He's a mean one. He bit me on the arm one time and took a dollar from me. So they arrested him. And it turned out that this uh, that this Algerian immigrant, whose nickname was Frenchy, had been the occupant of room thirty three the the night of the murder. And it further turned out that uh, this Frenchy had uh, occupied room thirty one with Carrie Brown a few nights earlier. Uh, so 
they, they arrested him as a um, material witness, not as a suspect, because everybody agreed that Frenchie was not the man who went into room 31 with Carrie Brown. He was not C. Nicklow. And they moved heaven and earth looking for C. Nicklow until the people at the East River Hotel said, well, you know, that's a made-up name. Uh, and then they decided, well, the guy who went into the room with Carrie Brown was a, a, a man that they called Frenchie Number 2. And uh, so they looked for Frenchie Number 2. And Burns even went so far as to say at one time that he thought Frenchie Number 2 was the person who committed the murder. And uh, they eventually found Frenchie Number 2, and he had an ironclad alibi. Uh, he was across town. I believe he had a night watchman job, if I can remember correctly. So Burns was going to have egg on his face for that misstatement, saying that he thought Frenchie Number 2 was the guy who, who, who committed the murder. Because very shortly after that, they arrested Amir Ben Ali, Frenchie Number 1, the occupant of Room 33. Yeah. Uh, things got a little confusing, you, you write, when Dr. Cyrus Edson, who was in charge of New York's Sanitary Bureau, held a press conference and prematurely announced that Frenchie was the killer of Kerry Brown and told reporters that he had been arrested. Yeah, he anointed himself a spokesman for the New York Police Department and made a lot of claims about things that he had found and things that uh, the evidence showed that were really not true. Uh, he proclaimed that... Uh, the, the blood spatters that had been found were hum, were definitely human blood. And I tried a bunch of murder cases, and I never got anybody from the lab to testify that any kind of blood spatters that we ever had were human blood. Uh, they said, well, we can tell you it's blood, but we can't tell you it's human blood. So, you know, and they definitely weren't, been, weren't able to do that back in the 1890s. So, you know, he, he, he kind of let his mouth overload his frame as far as some of the claims he was making about what could be proved and also about how the, the, the murder occurred. Uh, he made himself a blood spatter analyst before such a thing had ever been, uh, had ever been invented and was interpreted the blood spatters and interpreted them in a way that just wasn't true. Uh, he had uh, the victim reaching her bloody hand around and grabbing the shirt of a uh, Frenchie in an effort to defend herself. And as the autopsy showed, she was dead before he, she had been cut on. She had been strangled. And then after death was when the mutilation was done. So uh, there's no way that a dead body can get blood on her hand and then reach around to the back of an attacker and put and put a blood stain on the back of the on the back of his shirt. That just ain't gonna happen. So he really was helpful to the uh, to the to the efforts. And then it was the next day, I think, that uh, Burns finally came out and said, "Okay, we've arrested Frenchie. Uh, he's uh, he's a person who's good for it. Uh, we got two things that we need to do though that uh, to to nail our case down. We got to find the guy that was uh, in the room with Carrie Brown." And we need to figure out where that knife came from that was found in the bed with her. And once we get those two things solved, then our case will be complete. Well, they were never able to uh, find the man who spent the night with Carrie Brown that night, the Steve Nicklow fella. But they were able to connect the knife to Frenchie by the testimony of some jailbirds in the uh, Queens County Jail. Frenchie had been in the Queens County Jail shortly before the, the murder, and some inmates at the Queens County Jail saw him in possession of a knife that looked almost exactly like the knife that was found in the bed with Carrie, with Carrie Brown. The, the suspect was paraded in front of reporters by Chief Burns in an odd display. Right. And the reporters there were in turn fascinated by how Frenchie looked. To them, he looked strange 
and they kind of relished in describing his unique uh, foreign appearance. Uh, that's correct. He was kind of a scarecrow with long fingernails, oddly dressed. Uh, the, the clothes he had didn't quite fit him. And he had tattoos on his arms uh, that were, you know, somewhat odd. Had a naked woman on one, tat- on one arm. And then he had a uh, cross and crescent on the other arm, which uh, caused a lot of speculation. Uh, if he was a Muslim, what was he doing with a tattoo of a cross on his arm? And he did claim to be a Muslim. And then he had a picture of himself, uh, a tattoo of himself on his arm in an army uniform. And uh, so that, that gave all kinds of room for speculation. And what Burns hoped to accomplish by bringing him out and having that parade, I have no idea. It didn't make any sense to me. So I want to ask you more about this mysterious man. There were a couple of people who described him. Uh, One of them was a hotel employee named Mary. Yeah. And she saw old Shakespeare entering the hotel with a man she described as having a, a medium build and a thin brown mustache, right? Right, in a dented derby hat. And an, and an accent of some kind. Yeah, I think she said it was Dutch or German or something like that. And uh, she not 100% the most reliable witness in the world. Because she's the one that uh, uh, she's one of the ones that uh, that was calling him C. Niclo, uh, lying about his name. So you know she lied about that. Is is the description she gave true or isn't it? Uh, you don't know. Uh, they worked her around to where she was saying that Frenchie Number Two, who was an Algerian, was the person. And then when they finally got Frenchie Number Two to her, she said he wasn't the person. Plus, Frenchie number two had an alibi. So, you know, Burns got really put out with her and announced for the papers that uh, she was lying. Uh, but one thing about it, even after she, even after Burns announced she was lying, when she testified at the trial, she gave basically the same description of the, the, the C. Nicola, C. Nicola, uh character that she gave the first time she had described him. So... Who knows? So there were newspapers like the Evening World, you you write, that were not convinced that the police had the right man. What were the the arguments going on in the press against the idea of Frenchie as the killer? Well, there were a lot of people uh, who uh, knew Frenchie, uh, who had been around him, who said he was meek and mild and... uh, wouldn't hurt a fly. And he did a very good job of acting just as pitiful as possible. And they felt like that they had put so much pressure on Burns to make an arrest that he was going to grab somebody, anybody, to, uh, to satisfy them. So for the first few days of the investigation, they were jumping up and down hooping and hollering, saying, why hadn't he made an arrest? Why hadn't he made an arrest? He's moving too slow. And then Burns makes the arrest, and they say, oh, he moved too fast. He moved too fast. He just grabbed up the first available suspect to save face. So, you know, a kind of a darned if you do, darned if you don't sort of a situation. Whatever you did, it was going to be wrong. Right. So Burns wanted to wrap this up fast, and he was the one that really pushed for Wellman to be prosecutor in the case. Yeah, you know, Wellman said that Burns wanted Wellman because Wellman was the best prosecutor in the office. Wellman was definitely the best trial lawyer in the office. Uh, Wellman had a wealth of experience as a trial lawyer. He was a, he was kind of a rookie prosecutor, but. Uh, uh, Wellman had made a pretty good reputation for himself in the short time he'd been in the uh, district attorney's office. He was the first man in decades to actually win an arson case at trial. 
uh, that's something that just had, hadn't happened. So, you know, if you were to ask uh, Delancey Nickel, who's my best man, Nickel would have said, my best man is, uh, is Francis Wellman. But you write that, that Francis Wellman was overworked, too. He, he was juggling a lot of cases, and he was really crunched for time on this one. I, I, I tell you, first few years I was in the state attorney's office, I prosecuted a lot of cases. I mean, one right after another. Prosecuted more cases than anybody else in the office. And I thought I was, uh, you know, just tearing up the turf as far as trying cases, but I couldn't hold a candle to the number of daggum cases he tried. Uh, I made a timeline of the murder cases he tried, and uh, he was he was trying them if fast and furious. I mean, fast and furious. Uh, he'd finished one murder case, and we're talking complex murder cases. We're not talking, you know, bar fights with, with four or five witnesses. We're talking complex circumstantial evidence cases uh, like the, uh, the six capsules case. And he'd try one case like that, and then he'd, the next week he'd be trying another one like that. I don't see how he could have done it, but he did. And one way he did it was he wasn't quite as well prepared in trying cases as he should have been. But uh, he couldn't possibly have been pro- fully prepared to try cases the way he was trying them. So what was the, the prosecution's strategy? They, they were dealing with circumstantial evidence, right? Uh, it, was a, it was a 100% circumstantial evidence case. Their, their biggest piece of evidence was the blood evidence. Uh, the, the proximity of Frenchie to the, uh, to, to the victim and the blood evidence. And uh, as things stood after the coroner's inquest, they didn't have a case because the only expert they had was Cyrus Edson. And uh, the defense attorneys had torn him up on cross-examination. And they had to, you know, they had to get some more, some better doctors on board to look at that blood stains, look at those blood stains. And they did. They, got, they went to Philadelphia and recruited a, a doctor by the name of uh, Formad, who was one of the foremost medico-legal, doc, medico-legal doctors and experts in the United States at the time. And Dr. Formad uh, made some very, very uh, intriguing discoveries in his examination of some, some of the blood stains. And he actually came to New York and... Uh, performed examinations. And uh, the problem was though, that they waited to the last minute to recruit him. You know, they had a couple of months between the uh, uh, coroner's inquest and the trial, and they didn't bring him to New York until they started picking the jury. So he's doing his examination, and they're picking the jury. That's something they should have done immediately after the uh, coroner's inquest. But that's a, a lawyer's failing uh, is to put things off and procrastinate. And uh, it just about bit them that they did that. Dr. Formad, during his examinations, he said, you know, I need some help with this. And he called on a Dr. Austin Flint, uh, who was another uh, nationally renowned medical legal expert uh, who actually lived in New York City. And the two of them got together, put their heads together. They looked at the... Uh, at the, uh, at the at the blood spatters, the blood uh, the blood evidence, and they made some some of the most remarkable findings uh, that you could imagine. Quality of investigation into those blood stains that would uh, compare favorably to the 21st century forensic examination. I had no idea that they could do that kind of work over a hundred years ago. What to you was the most remarkable finding? Well, uh, Dr. Formad uh, and Dr. Edson looked at the blood first, looked at the blood stains first. And they said, okay, this is human blood. Oh, well, not, excuse me, this, it was human blood because it couldn't have come from anywhere else. He said, we can't say it's human blood, but this blood came from, these blood stains came from intestines. And they were having trouble figuring out where in the intestines that the blood was coming from. And they were thinking maybe they came out of these large intestines. Uh, called in Dr. Flint, 
Dr. Flint comes in, he looks at, he looks at the blood stains, looks at the, uh, the, the slides, and he says, uh, this blood came from the small intestines, and it came, I forget just exactly where, it's, uh, where it was, he said it came from this portion of the small intestines. It came from the part of the small intestines just before the small intestines empty into the uh, large intestines. I forget the name of it, of that portion. And I said, yeah, you can really tell that? He said, yeah, that's, that's where it came from. Haven't y'all, have y'all looked at the autopsy report? And I said, no, we haven't looked at the autopsy report. So well, let's get the autopsy report and see if this doesn't bear out what I have, what I have uh, determined. So they sent for the autopsy report. They got the autopsy report in. And sure enough, the only portion of the woman's intestines which had actually been cut was that portion of the intestines that the Dr. Flint had named, which to me is, uh, you know, remarkable that he could uh, say, no, this came from the small intestines and this came from this part of the small intestines. And the fluid, uh, intestinal fluid, the, the digested food, there were some roundworm eggs in the blood. All of this stuff was in the blood stains that were under Frenchy's fingernails. Okay, forget about the blood stains in the hall. How did uh, Frenchy get blood stains from that portion of the intestines under all 10 of his fingernails if he didn't kill her? And uh, and one other thing, the the woman the woman's blood was leukemic. She she had leukemia. Okay, the blood under French's fingernails was leukemic. Okay, now, ain't everybody in uh, New York City got leukemia? Pretty rare disease. And it, it hadn't been long before uh, since they had uh, had identified leukemia as a disease. So Frenchy's got ten fingernails with that kind of blood under his fingernails. And the only person in New York City that was killed that night and had that portion of her intestines punctured and had leukemia was Carrie Brown. So how in the world did he get that stuff under his fingernails if he didn't kill her? You know, and when Francis Wellman made his opening statement, he didn't know all that because they hadn't found all that out yet. The opening statement he made was a, was a pretty good opening statement if it had been true. But a lot of the things he said in his opening statement, it wasn't going to be able to prove. I think the defense made a tactical blunder when they did not defend against Wellman's opening statement rather than against the evidence that was presented. Because they could have, uh, you know, they could have said, all right, remember what Mr. Wellman said in the opening statement? He said this, and they didn't prove it. He said this, and they didn't prove it. He said this, and they didn't prove it. Now, he promised you he was going to prove all this. And if he can't prove it, then that's reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. you got to turn him loose. They didn't say that. They defended against the evidence that was put on, and the evidence that was put on was a lot stronger than the evidence that uh, was talked about in opening statement. Right. So, yeah, uh, just to clarify, there was a grand jury investigation and the grand jury indicted Frenchy on May 18th of four counts, you write. The first one was murder by manual strangulation. The second, murder by means of a garrote. The third, stabbing with a knife. And the fourth, murder in some manner and by some means to the grand jury unknown. Yeah, that's what you call alternative pleading. They were covering all their bases. Uh, if the uh, grand jury, did, if the petty jury didn't like one method of killing uh, as being proved, then they could find him guilty on, a, on another method of, be, of killing. And that's, you know, that, that's pretty standard uh, as far as a, a, a method of pleading is concerned. Uh, even as august a personage as Abraham Lincoln, uh, on the rare occasions what he prosecuted would do that, he would and engage in alternative pleading. So Wellman, in, in his opening statement, in laying out his case, stated that Frenchy, the day before the murder, 
had spent the day drinking with old Shakespeare, and a prostitute named Alice Sullivan had heard him tell her that he and old Shakespeare would would sleep together in the hotel. She heard him tell her that he was going to be at the East River Hotel that night. He said, I think the exact words she said, he, that she said, he said was, sleep at tonight, East River Hotel, which, you know, was some evidence that he could speak English. And then another piece of testimony important to the case was from the janitor, Edward Fitzgerald who told the court that he had seen Frenchie slip out of the building under the cover of darkness. Sneaking out of the building is way, how he described it. And uh, the uh, defense attorney uh, objected to him and characterizing it as sneaking. So uh, they had uh, Fitzgerald to demonstrate how he left the building. And um, he got down off the witness stand and snuck along the wall, uh, showing the furtive way that that, uh, Frenchie went out of the building. So one of the most interesting parts of the trial for me, what was the testimony of Frenchie himself? He actually got on the stand. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, if I had been defending Frenchie, I'd have worked as hard as I could to keep him off the witness stand. Uh, because I don't think he did himself any favors uh, by testifying. He did not, to my way of thinking, came, come across as being very truthful. He was evasive. He wouldn't admit anything. Uh, he was self-contradictory. He was just a terrible witness uh, for the defense. And then Wellman made a huge mistake that uh, could have ended very poorly, very badly for him when he picked up the murder weapon, the knife, and handed it to Frenchie. You know, that's really not something you need to do if you cross-examining a mad dog killer is give him a sharp implement. And uh, uh, especially when you have been beating him over the head, asking him questions on cross-examination for about an hour. And Frenchie just erupted into uh, a, a tirade, waved his arms, acted like a madman, and scared the mud out of Wellman. And he backed off, and uh, the judge, uh, Judge Frederick Smythe, or Smith, uh, said, somebody take that knife away from him. And the bailiff, I assume it was the bailiff, got the knife away from him, and things kind of settled down. And Wellman wrote it up in the memoirs as if you know, he had done a, a slick tactical trick by getting uh, Frenchie to expose himself as a, a wild man uh, by handing the knife and having him act like that. But, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty enough a, a silly mistake. Uh, he could have gotten bad hurt by handing that daggum knife to Frenchie. Frenchie's mood changed often uh, through the trial. Yes. At, at points he'd be crying. At other points he'd be confused. Yeah, he'd be, he'd, you know, he'd be angry. He'd be sullen. You know, at the end of the uh, coroner's inquest, when the uh, coroner's jury found that, uh, that he was the person who had killed Carrie Brown, he thought they were going to take him out and kill him right then. He wasn't really, didn't really understand a whole lot of what was going on. You know, he had, after he went to prison, he had a, a mental illness manifest itself and wound up in, wound up spending most of his time in a mental institution. It may have been that he had some mental health issues during the trial that uh, should have been addressed by the defense team. So how did Frenchie's attorneys plan to defend him? Um, his main counsel was a man named Fred House, um, right? How did yes. he do overall? Well, House, I thought, made it, did a, a barn burner of a final argument or a summation. What you've got to do in a circumstantial evidence case 
where the, the evidence is pretty heavy against you is uh, to uh, find something else to talk about. And what he talked about was the poor, pitiful uh, Frenchie uh, who had uh, heard of the wonderful land of promise in the United States and had come over here to, uh, to, to make, his, uh, make his fortune. And this poor, innocent child of the desert was now caught in the toils of uh, the criminal justice system and being relentlessly persecuted by the uh, machinery of the uh, district attorney's office in the uh, New York Police Department and uh, pitying poor, poor, pitiful him. And, you know, that was one of the first things that Delancey Nickel tried to uh, tried to do in his uh, summation was to try to take some of the sting out of that uh, very eloquent final argument that uh, that House had made. All this is well and good, but here, let's talk about the evidence. Let's talk about the facts. And the facts show that he's guilty. So there was an air of mystery about Frenchie. Newspapers were jumping all over each other, trying to figure out what his background was. And there was some debate about whether he had served in the military or not, right? Yeah, he uh, going into the trial, he told one story about uh, uh, his military service. At the trial, he told another story about his military service. And then after the trial, we got a third story about his military service. And uh, they couldn't all three be true. He definitely, I think, was a member of the French military uh, because the French did recruit native troops from uh, Algeria to to serve both in Algeria and in uh, France during the uh, Franco-Prussian War. And uh, the story he told at the uh, at the trial was that he was in a Turco division or a Turco battalion that had been sent to France and had fought in France and had then returned to uh, uh, to Algeria and actually fought in uh, what they call the, the Kabyle, uh, if I pronounced it correctly, uh, rebellion towards the end of the Franco-Prussian War. And I tracked down the uh, troops uh, that uh, were involved in the Franco-Prussian War and there was a Turco uh, unit that was sent over from Algeria to France and was involved in combat in France against the Prussians and the numbers of the of the units coincided so that seemed to me to be the most likely story or the most likely truth about his uh, military service plus uh, he had uh, gotten some assistance from the French consulate in New York City, and the French consul attended the trial. The French consul would have known what his military service was, and he sure couldn't lie about his military service in front of the French consul. So that's probably what what the uh, what his service actually was. Now, later he claimed he was in the French Foreign Legion, which was not true. So Frenchy was found guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison and sent to Sing Sing, right? Right. And uh, at Sing Sing, his uh, mental condition deteriorated to the point that they sent him to Mat Awan uh, Asylum for the Criminally Insane. I say he spent, he spent most of his time in prison in a mental institution. While he was ser- serving a sentence, he was given English lessons. Uh, he improved his English speaking, yes. To begin with, he was, he was not a happy camper. He lost a lot of weight, and then he went into his madness and got a little bit better when they sent him to, uh, to the mental institution, uh, improved, uh, went to work, became a fairly well model model inmate until he tried to kill one of the uh, one of the other inmates there and uh, 
then he went into a kind of a depression again and came out of it a little bit later and developed into a model model prisoner after that. So he, he was eventually able to articulate in English how he believed the blood got under his fingernails, right? Yeah. How he claimed the blood got under his fingernails. He, he said that when the police had scraped away material from under his fingernails for evidence, they poked him too hard and, and made him bleed. Right. That, that, that's, that's how the blood had gotten there. And if you believe that, I got some oceanfront property in Arizona. That I'd like to talk to you about. He said that they took the uh, fingernail scrapings from him the day that he was arrested. The fingernail scrapings were taken from him three days later by, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the officer's name that took the took it. And a big, huge issue was made out of that at trial, saying, well, you know, goodness gracious, why did they wait three days? What, what's the value of waiting three days? They should have done it immediately. So, He's obviously lying, and this was after this was after the fact, and this was after he had been released from prison that he was telling this story. And he also told the story after he'd been released from prison, explaining the blood stains on his shirt that they took the shirt away from him and then carried it off somewhere, and then came back and said, "Oh, look at the blood on the, we found on his shirt," and that there was no blood on his shirt uh, when they took it away from him. And again, that's you know that's baloney. Uh, one of the first things they asked him when they when they arrested him was, uh, you know, what's that blood on your shirt? And he told them that he'd gotten the blood from, uh, I believe, having relations with a prostitute who was uh, men- menstruating. One of his big problems was that he lied like a cheap clock and he kept changing his story. And they put in, I don't know how many different versions of lies that he had told at the trial. And, you know, you don't help yourself by lying and changing your story. You help yourself, if you're innocent, by telling the truth and sticking to one story. Right. So the thing that really helped turn the tide in his favor was when a man named George Damon came forward. And and he presented new evidence that hadn't been offered before. All right. There was a constant campaign after Frenchy went to prison to get him out. The, the newspapers didn't let it die. They kept running human interest articles about what a terrible time Frenchy was having in prison and what a nice guy he was. And, uh, you know, pay no attention to the fact that he brained a guy with a club. And there had been several pardon petitions that had been made to various governors. And these pardon petitions were made by the French consulate were made on behalf of the French consulate. They petitioned Governor Flower. They petitioned the next governor, Governor Black. They petitioned the next governor, who was Governor Roosevelt. And then the th- fourth governor that they petitioned was uh, was uh, Governor Benjamin Odell. Okay, so they had been going for years, petitioning again, again, and again, and again, uh, trying to get him out and get him pardoned. And there was a kind of an odd statement made right after Roosevelt refused to pardon. Roosevelt said, look, uh, I'm not going to pardon this guy. There's no change in the evidence. He was found guilty. And you haven't shown me any reason to think he ain't guilty. And they said to the the consulate uh, attorney, uh, said to the news at that time, said, well, we think we might be able to satisfy that requirement by the governor. Okay. So they waited about a year. And there was a new governor in office. And here they come with a guy by the name of George Damon, who said that uh, on the night that uh, Kerry Brown got murdered, uh, I had a had a field hand working for him by the name of Frank. I can't remember his last name. And he stayed out all night long that night and come home in a bad mood. And my other field hand uh, who worked with me, I can't remember his name either, told me don't wake him up because he came in drunk and he's in a, he's in a terrible mood. And so uh, a couple of days later, Frank disappeared. And my maid went up to clean out his room in the, uh, in the barn there. And I can't remember her name either. And uh, she went up there and found a bloody shirt. 
And not only that, she found a key. And so I took that key and I went to New York City. I'd read about that uh, uh, killing at the East River Hotel. And I went into the East River Hotel and uh, bellied up to the bar and examined the keys on the keyboard behind the bar and then looked at the key that I had. And man, that key that I had was a perfect match for the keys that were hanging on the keyboard at the East River Hotel. So uh, I had proof positive that this guy they arrested, Frenchy, was innocent. That this guy, Frank, who was from Denmark and had the bloody shirt, must be the one who killed her. Must be the one who killed Carrie. He killed her, got his shirt bloody, uh, locked her up in that room, brought the key to my house, my farmhouse, and then a couple of days later disappeared, left his bloody shirt and the key. And uh, I decided I wouldn't tell anybody about it because I figured that Frenchy was better off in jail than he was running the street. Never mind the fact that he was facing the death penalty. And uh, if the jury found him guilty of first degree murder, they'd put him in old Sparky up at Sing Sing. So I kept my mouth shut for 10 years while he rotted in prison. And uh, I had the sock dollar evidence that was going to prove him innocent. And now, in a burst of altruism, I think I will come forward and prove him innocent. And uh, he gave an affidavit to that effect. And they took the uh, affidavit and went to Governor Odell and got her gathered up a few more affidavits. And... Uh, argued the case to Governor Odell. Governor Odell uh, said to ask the district attorney what he thought about it. And the district attorney at that time was no longer Delancey Nickel, the man who prosecuted the case. Uh, he was another man who uh, was not a fan of the New York Police Department. And uh, he said, uh, go ahead and pardon him uh, without doing any kind of an investigation into the veracity of this George Damon guy. So Odell doesn't pardon him. What he does is he commutes Frenchy's sentence and releases him from prison with the proviso that if he ever commits another felony, he goes back to prison for the rest of his life. Uh, in, a letter, in the opinion that he writes, uh, justifying his decision, he says, there's nothing wrong with the investigation that the police did. They did their best. But, you know, there's that lingering doubt. And uh, I'm going to give him the benefit of that doubt, and I'm going to commute his sentence. Well, they had made arrangements with French consulate to, as soon as Frenchy's feet hit the ground outside the, uh, the grounds of the uh, mental institution where he was, they are going to put him on a boat and send him back to Algeria. And that's exactly what they did. So the newspapers just went wild saying Frenchy had been pardoned. They had proved that the police had railroaded Frenchy, that this was a vindication of uh, a, a poor, friendless man who had been chewed up in the coals of, in the, in the toils of justice, etc., and so forth. And uh, Thomas Burns at that time had been retired for several years. So get a half, what I consider a half-baked story that is given, that is not investigated, that is not checked out, and that is backed up by pressure from the French government. Uh, so get this man who used to be a French soldier out of prison so we can take him home and what I think happened was Odell said, okay, just as long as we make sure he gets put on a boat and goes back to where he came from, and we don't have to mess with him in New York City anymore. And that's what happened. Now, I said, said in the book, uh, I made some observation that if Damon had undergone cross-examination about that story, that uh, he probably would not have survived the cross-examination about that story. 
because if Francis Wellman had got a hold of him, I think Francis Wellman had, would have chewed him up and spit him out. And after the book was published, uh, I made the acquaintance of a gentleman by the name of Howard Brown, who has a, uh, a website on the Carrie Brown murder. It's called CarrieBrown.net. And he shared with me a newspaper article uh, about this George Damon being involved in a lawsuit after the, uh, the, the Carrie Brown case was over with. And he was testifying in this lawsuit. He was suing somebody about something. I forget exactly what. And somehow the uh, defense attorney was able to cross-examine him about his testimony in the Kerry Brown case. And according to the newspaper, uh, Damon didn't do very well on cross-examination uh, in that uh, civil case when he was asked questions about the Kerry Brown case on cross-examination. So I have absolutely zero confidence in what, the, in what George Damon had to say. What was the motive, do you, do you believe, in the crime, the murder of Carrie Brown? Who knows? You know, it's that old saying from uh, uh, that radio show, The Shadow, who knows what evil lurks in the minds of man? The Shadow uh, knows. The Shadow knows, yeah. Uh, that's why you don't have to uh, prove motive in a murder case. Because people kill for these strangest of motives. I had a case one time involved a woman that uh, chopped a man's head off because he wouldn't lo- wouldn't lend her a dollar. So you know it don't take much to motivate some people to commit murder. Uh, I have speculated. I did not speculate in the book as to as to her motive, but I speculated uh, in my own mind. You know maybe. Uh, that's some of that madness, the mental illness uh, surfacing. Possibly he thought she had swallowed some money, swallowed some coins, and he wanted them. He had done violence to uh, one prostitute. Was I, I think it was Dublin Mary. Was, no, it wasn't Dublin Mary. He was I can't remember the prostitute's name that... Uh, he paid her a dollar for her services and then he wanted the dollar back and she wouldn't give it back to him. So he attacked her and bit her and got the dollar back. So, you know, he would do violence to women to get money from them. You know, it's possible he thought Carrie had some money in her stomach and he's going to get it. But, you know, all that is sheer speculation. Don't know why people do what they do. And you don't really know that he did it. Because after he was gone, uh, after he set sail, uh, there's one more event uh, that took place, one more revelation from a, uh, 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 I think it was a William Thompson was his name. I might be might have that name wrong, uh, who was an actor in uh, New York City. And he was playing in a play in, uh, I think it was Buffalo, New York at the time. He heard news of it. And he started telling people around town, he said, you know, that guy confessed. That Frenchy guy confessed. I don't know why they turned him loose. And if somebody went and told a newspaper reporter in, in, uh, in Buffalo about what Thompson was saying, the newspaper reporter went and uh, spoke to Thompson and says, what's this I hear you saying about uh, Frenchy confessed? And he said, well, I was friends with Frenchy's interpreter during the trial. You know, the guy who was working as Frenchy's interpreter. He's a cigar salesman, and I bought cigars from him. And he told me Frenchie confessed. He said, Frenchie said that he snuck into her room the night that she was murdered after her boyfriend left, and she was cut to pieces, and he got blood on himself, and then he went back to his room. Okay, that's not quite a confession. That is an admission to some uh, very incriminating facts. And that also explains uh, how Frenchie could have gotten Carrie Brown's blood under his fingernails without having killed her. And if Frenchie had told that story and that story only and had not told so dad blame many lies and he got on the witness stand at the trial and said that, 
he just may have walked. And if what he said was true about how he got the blood under his fingernails, uh, to what he said to Spurco about what he, how he got the blood under his fingernails, the best thing he could have done was going in there, seen what happened, and holler just as loud as he could and say, come on, come, come quick, come quick. My girlfriend, her John has killed her. She invited me to come back in, come into the room with him after the, with her after the, the John left, and I did. And here she is dead. He's killed her. And if he'd have done that, he spent some some time in jail in the, uh, the House of Detention for Witnesses, but he wouldn't have been prosecuted for murder. So, did he kill her? Did he not kill her? I believe he did. But there's a story there, and there's an interpretation of the facts, uh, which uh, could make him innocent. And if you want to believe that uh, the story that he told Constance Spurco, that Spurco told to Thompson, then you ain't going to hurt my feelings. I can't remember if a prostitute testified to this or if it was just, I don't remember this, this situation, but she had told authorities at, at some point that she had spent a really weird night with Frenchie yes. where he had gotten up six or seven times in the middle of the night and, and kind of walked the hallways of the hotel. And he would go up and down checking the doors of the various rooms. Yeah. Uh, you know, looking for something to steal. So that theory that you propose that Frank the Dane or whoever he was accompanied Carrie Brown to room 31, killed her, left, and then Frenchie came to see her and found her dead, definitely a possibility. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, I don't think it was Frank the Dane. I think Frank the Dane is a figment of George Damon's imagination. The man with the brown mustache. Yeah, C. Niccolo. Uh, You know, it very well could be C. Niccolo. Here is the problem with that. Uh, And I think that uh, the prosecution anticipated this problem and prepared for it. It was the knife, the knife in the bed, the bloody knife. The knife was identified by three men as looking just exactly like the kind of knife Frenchie had in the, in the Queens County Jail. And the prosecution did not put did not do a very good job of uh, presenting that evidence because the way that the way the evidence came to light was the men were talking about this in the jail, and an informant in the jail went to the sheriff told the sheriff what the men were talking about. And then the sheriff called the New York Police Department and said, come over here, you need to talk to some of these inmates because they say that this guy had, been in, had a knife and looks just like the one that was shown in the paper when he was in the jail here. Okay, so they, the, the, the police come over, they interview him, and they say, yeah, he had a knife, looked just like it, or words to that effect. Now, none of that was placed in evidence. That's how it came. That's how it came to light, but none of it was placed in evidence. So they just brought in three jailbirds, and three jailbirds said, "You know, we we saw Frenchie with a knife. Looked like one in evidence." Okay, first thing you think is, well, they have uh, they have been uh, given something uh, quid pro quo to just tell this story. They come forward hoping for some kind of uh, some kind of benefit, but it's not the way that. You know, that's not the way that the story came to light. Uh, they didn't come looking to tell the police what they saw. The police came looking for them because they heard they saw it. And there's a huge difference in credibility of the witnesses based on the way it was presented. You know, and of course, the, uh, the defense was, well, you know, he was searched when he was put in jail. The guy that searched him didn't find a knife. And then uh, Wellman just ripped the uh, officer that searched him up one side and down the other. And turned out the officer did a sorry job of searching him. And then the uh, defense said, well, he got searched again when they put him in jail by the jailer. And they went over to the Queens County Jail and they questioned the jailer. 
And the jailer says, yeah, I, I searched him, but I did a sorry job of searching him myself. He could have had a knife in there. We don't search people put in, uh, put in jail for vagrancy, all that so thoroughly. And then they didn't call him as a witness. Uh, the prosecution didn't call him as a witness. There was all kinds of things they could have done to have bolstered the credibility of the men who saw Frenchie with the knife that they didn't do. I'm not saying I could have done a better job of prosecuting the case or that I could have done a better job of defending the case. But, uh, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and I see all kinds of things that both sides did wrong. Well, there is so much that we haven't even touched on. Um, this is the perfect book for anyone who really loves Victorian-era crime in New York City. Well, I, uh, I thoroughly love that era. I guess it goes back to uh, when I read Sherlock Holmes as, as a teenager. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite times. And muckraking journalist Jacob Reese makes an appearance in your book, too. Yeah. Uh, yes, he does. And uh, another muckraker was the, uh, Charles, Edward, like Charles Edward Russell. He's in the book. Uh, the, uh, the real larger-than-life character, though, who really got his name blackened unjustly was Thomas Burns. If Frenchie was falsely convicted, it's his own darn fault. It ain't the fault of the police. So your book has just recently been published. Right. And for people who want to learn more about you and all of the the books you've written, uh, they can go to bobdeekelbooks.com, B-O-B. D-E-K-L-E-B-O-O-K-S. Right. Yes, sir. Well, th- this has been excellent. I really appreciate your time today. Th- this is one of my favorite time periods, so. Well, I'm, I'm working on another one for that time period. Uh, we're going to go to Toronto and uh, look at a murder that was prosecuted by the greatest uh, Victorian-era Canadian prosecutor that ever lived. But that's about two years down the pipe, though. Oh, what what is the prosecutor's name? His name is Britton Bath Osler, O-S-L-E-R. A very distinguished uh, legal and medical family in Canada. Well, uh, I look forward to to having you back in two years. Well, I'll uh, be sure to uh, let you know when I get it done. I guess we'll reconnect every couple of years. (laughs) All righty. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks again. Again, I have been speaking to George R. Deakle, Sr. His book is called The East River Ripper, The Mysterious 1891 Murder of Old Shakespeare. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Revenis, and have a safe tomorrow.